At this stage, Mr. President, I should just say I agree and call it a, a night, shouldn't I? There's, there's really no other, there's no other response apt to the occasion. But you know what? While I'm on my feet, Mr. President, I'm going to say one other thing. The bailouts were an epical crime where low and medium income people were required to rescue some extremely wealthy bankers and bondholders from the consequences of their own errors. This will one day be seen as a generational offence. The government has now admitted £60 billion, which the taxpayers put up, will never be reclaimed. In fact, the total cost of the bailouts was a trillion pounds. We know where the money came from. We don't know where it is now. We don't know who's got it. There's been no accounting. And that happened. That happened, Mr. President, from a breakdown of the democratic system. It happened in those panicky days, in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of Lehman. Politicians were running around all over the Western world not knowing what to do. And in their panic, they turned to the one set of people who, by definition, could not give them disinterested advice, namely the bankers. They said, what do we do? Well, of course, the bankers said, subsidize the banks. You know what? If you'd asked the bakers whether to subsidize the bakeries, you'd have got the same answer. That's why they're not the people to ask. That's the whole basis of our democratic system. I remember those days very well. I was one of the only, I think the only four elected politicians in Britain to oppose the bailouts at the time on that first day. And I remember a very senior member of my party saying to me, you are on your own on this. No one agrees with you. Left to right, there is an absolute consensus. We've got to save the system. He said, all right, you and Ron Paul, referring to the maverick American Republican. Well, a week later, the first opinion poll came out, and I was able to email this very senior member of my party and say, look, it turned out to be me, Ron Paul, and 87% of the British population. <laughs> because people understood, even if their leaders didn't, that it was wrong to clobber the little guy in order to reward the corporate. So why am I... And, and I am on this side unhesitatingly because the Occupy crowd are occupying the wrong place. I mean, in this country, they were literally occupying the wrong place. They set out to occupy the stock exchange. They ended up in St. Paul's Cathedral on grounds that it's kind of, well, vaguely near the stock exchange. I mean, um, but you know what? Even if they'd had a better sense of direction and found the place they were after, they'd have still been occupying the wrong place. There is a world of difference between being pro-business and being pro-market. Sometimes those two positions happen to coincide. Often they do not. Corporatism is not the same thing as capitalism. I want to challenge three propositions in the short time I've got. I've been a, I was a journalist before I was elected, so I, I recognize when a story has passed the point of correction, and these have probably all passed that point, but I'm going to have a go anyway. First of all, the idea that we are living through a failure of capitalism, crisis of the market system. Secondly, that the banking collapse was caused by a lack of regulation. And thirdly, to the, uh, thirdly the idea that we have uh, been brought here by greed, by human weakness. We start with the first one, the failure of capitalism. I mean, I can't believe I'm having to come to the Oxford Union and explain that subsidies and nationalizations are the opposite of capitalism. And yet that seems to be the contention of the Occupy crowd. Now, in a capitalist system, bad banks would have failed, their profitable operations would have been sold to more efficient competitors, bondholders would have lost money, shareholders would have lost money, some depositors would have lost money, taxpayers would not have contributed a penny. The failure of a business and its replacement by a rival is not a sign that the capitalist system isn't working. It's a sign that the capitalist system is working, just as you weed your garden to make space for new growth. It's precisely that replacement of inefficient old producers by better new ones that has raised humanity to the highest standard of living we have ever enjoyed. Now, you might say, well, all right, but what about the regulation? Well, we heard it from two or three of the speakers on the other side. You know, there wasn't proper regulation. Just ask yourselves, with the exception of nuclear power, possibly of some television broadcasting. What industry is more regulated than financial services? The FSA handbook, the guide on how to comply with their regulations, is 10 and a half thousand pages long. The idea that this was a, a failure of regulation is the opposite of the truth, and that is an extremely dangerous mistake to make. 
because by responding to the crisis with further regulation, we repeat the mistakes that led to it in the first place and we make the next one likely. Why? It was the cost of compliance that drove the small providers out of the market. It was the regulation that forced the consolidation, which is what created this wretched too big to fail phenomenon in the first place. In a properly, the, the, the ideal system, the one we should aim at, is not a system where a bank can't fail, but a system where a bank can fail without it being a problem, without the taxpayer having to come and rescue it. In other words, where there is a plurality of small providers, each striving to offer a better service. We have the precise opposite of that. We have a series of zombie banks crawling malodorously with their bandages hanging off because we don't allow the market to take its natural course. Failure of capitalism, no. Failure of regulation, no. But let's take on the third of those propositions. The idea that what we're really doing on this side whatever we say, what we're really doing is somehow standing up for greed, that our system is based on more selfishness or uh, less generosity, less decency than the other. You know, one very good point that the last speaker made, we are all fallen. If by greed we mean desire for material possessions, that isn't produced by socialism or capitalism or any other ism. That is depending on your point of view, hardwired into the genetic codes we evolved in Pleistocene Africa or else given by our creator. But one way or another, that is a side of human beings. So the question then becomes, how do you harness that instinct in a socially productive way? And for all its imperfections, the market has up until now been the best way to do that. Why? Because in a capitalist system, you to use the pejorative phrase, you fulfill your greed. In other words, you uh, attain your desire for material possessions by providing a service to someone else. When I buy a program from Microsoft, I am enriching Bill Gates. I am adding fractionally to his net wealth. But he is enriching me because he's providing me with the program. Each of us has benefited from the transaction. Under every other system yet devised by human intelligence, a third party, a commissar or a king, gets to hand out the goodies. And the way you then enrich yourself is not by being productive to your neighbours, but by crawling to those who are in a position of power. The transformation of our planet, the rise of wealth to a level which a previous generation could not have conceived, came because of the development of markets and mass consumerism. In an aristocratic system, the way you got ahead was to perform for the patrons, for a small number of oligarchs. It was consumerism that made it pay for the people who had the inventions, who had the good ideas, to aim them at the rest of us. As the great economist Joseph Schumpeter put it, the princess was always able to afford silk stockings, but it took capitalism to bring them within reach of the shop girl. Let me close by asking you to think of who have been the real enemies of Wall Street, the real enemies of stock exchanges through the ages. They've got some pretty dishonorable foes. During the Second World War, the city of London was repeatedly targeted by the Nazis because they understood that the free market system was part of what they saw as our degenerate system, in other words, one based on free contract and personal liberty. The stock exchange was repeatedly singled out by Luftwaffe bombers. When the Soviet Union expanded, the first thing they would do, taking over a new country, would be to close down the bourse. And on September the 11th, the murderers struck at the heart of New York capitalism, well understanding that the thing they most liked and resent, uh, most disliked and resented about the West the personal freedom was represented in that building. Surely we are better than to line up with those kinds of enemies. So no, don't occupy Wall Street. Don't occupy the London Stock Exchange. Don't even occupy St. Paul's on the grounds that it's on the way. Occupy the central banks that have printed the money in order to get around the failures of a handful of banksters. Occupy the, the houses of the politicians who voted to give your money 
to people who were not prepared to live with the consequences of their own errors. And on your way to occupy those places, occupy the, the no-lobby tonight and vote for freedom.